And uh, once again, it's a pleasure to be with you all in the Lord's house tonight. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 2 with me. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. And as we're continuing to study the creation of the world together, uh, we've come to the Garden of Eden, man's uh, original dwelling place. And I'd like us to see in this section uh, what, uh, how it was that man lived in uh, his original state of goodness. Uh, we'll see his home and his occupation and his religion at the earliest, and we'll also see the first covenant that was struck between God and man, the covenant of works. And so if you have your Bibles in Genesis 2, we'll begin reading in verse number 8 together. The scripture says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the garden, uh, out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer together. Our Father, we come to you again and we thank you for giving us this uh, passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for giving us a, a glimpse into the earliest uh, times of man's history. Lord, that you were so good to man to put him in your holy garden. And Lord, we thank you that you've told us uh, that, uh, as we'll see later, Lord, we pray that uh, you've showed us how mankind lost that first estate. Lord, we thank you that you were so gracious uh, to us to uh, cut a new covenant with us in Christ. Lord, that though you had removed us from our original home, uh, that nonetheless you have a home for us uh, yet to come. Uh, Lord, that you will bring us right back into your presence by the grace of Jesus. And we pray that you would help us to always see that and always uh, bow before you because of thankfulness towards him. Lord, we pray that if there be any lost here with us tonight, that you would show them to him, uh, show him to them, Lord, that you would open their eyes to see his gospel, uh, Lord, that they are in need of forgiveness of sins, and Lord, that he provides forgiveness to those who trust in him. And Lord, we just pray that they would be saved. Lord, we ask you to be with those who could make it to worship with us tonight, and Lord, that you'd keep them safe and bring them back to us in your due time. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who are uh, suffering among our people, Lord, uh, Lord, those who uh, will be going through medical treatment, uh, Lord, we ask that you would be gracious to them, Lord, that you would comfort their hearts, that, uh, Lord, it would not cause them any more suffering uh, than uh, is due, any more suffering than they can handle, Lord. We pray that you would help the doctors to be wise in this, and, uh, Lord, that uh, they would be uh, remedied in your time. Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you tonight, that you would forgive us, and that you would bring us into your presence by the Holy Ghost. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're looking at the original state of the creation of the world. We've looked at the cosmology of the world in the scripture. We've looked at uh, all of the various um, uh, creatures that God made uh, in the creation. And now we're looking at where it was that God placed mankind when he had created him. And the first thing I'd like us to see about the creation that God made and put man into is the character of the creation that he made. And by this I mean, what, what, was, the, what was the creation generally like? Uh, how, was it, uh, how was it governed? How, was it, um, how did it, it, it fall out at the very first? Uh, and the character of the creation we see was first a functional creation. It served the role that God made it to serve. And it was a moral creation. It was, it was a good creation in the moral sense. First we see that it was functional. That is, it speaks to the function that God made everything for. Uh, the often refrain in Genesis 1 was that God saw that it was very good. When God made the, the creation, he looked at it and he said, this is very good. This, this works. This is functional that I have made. In Genesis 1 and verse 3, it says, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. 
And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God, God made the light, that is, he made the period of light, the daytime, and he ordained it for uh, the function of keeping the, the daily rhythm of the world. And so it, 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 it was good that he made that. It was functional that he created the light. And likewise, the creation was not called very good. That is, it was not a complete creation until God made mankind and set him in it. And we read in Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. When God made mankind, when he made his image and installed it into the creation, then it was very good. Because all of the creation, all of this, all of this earth that God has made is centered around mankind. In fact, it's just the environment in which we as mankind live and, and so serve God as his image. And so the creation that God made was functional. And when he installed man in it, it served its function. It was a good creation. It, it, it worked well. And we also see that the creation God made was not just functional. It wasn't just like a machine that, that works, but it was a good creation, a moral creation that God made. The original character of the moral agents that God made, that is mankind and the angels, was very good. Mankind in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, it says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. God made man good, a moral creature, a righteous creature. But they have sought out many inventions. And we'll see that later in our study. But God made man upright. He made him very good at the beginning. Not just to function in the creation, but also to be a moral creature and a righteous creature before God. And that's how he was in the, in the beginning. He was a moral creature. And the angels also that God made at the beginning were good. That they, were, they were righteous. All of them that God made, in the moment that he made them, they were righteous before his eyes. In Ezekiel 28 verse 14, Speaking of even Satan himself, Thou art the anointing cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways. From the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. He, he, was, he was perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in him. He was righteous. He was, he was morally good until that day that he fell from his goodness. And so when God made the world, it was a good creation. Not only did it function rightly, not only did everything that he made have a, a part to play in the creation to the edification of his people and to his glory, but it was also very good. It was, it was also a moral creation. It was righteous. It was, it was flawless and without iniquity in it. And in this creation, there was one place that was above all else. And that's what we read here in our passage. That is the garden of the Lord. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put man whom he had Formed. He planted this garden in Eden. We've seen that the creation already is God's temple. It's the, it's the, it's the tabernacle that he's made for himself. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah 66, 1 says, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, says the Lord. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. He, he says, where is the house that you build to me? Where is, where is the, the, the place of, of my resting as your God that you will, will construct for me? Because look, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. I've made all of these things to serve that purpose. And, 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 and how will we build to him a temple? 
And God also ordained the various temples and tabernacles in the, in the nation state of Israel. He ordained them to, to imitate this, this great temple that he has made. We've been reading in Exodus quite a bit, and we have read several times something like Exodus 26.30. Thou shalt rear up the temple according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. In Hebrews, uh, we read that this was the pattern of the heavenly temple, the, the temple of the Lord that is not made by the hands of man, but made by God himself. When Moses went up onto the top of the mountain and he communed with God there, God showed him all the creation that he had made from the top of that mountain. And he said, make sure that you make your tabernacle after this fashion, after this pattern that I've established in the created world. And so he built the tabernacle. And the first temple that God ever ordained for men of this kind, the first temple that, that was to imitate the creation that he had made, was this garden in Eden. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was a temple that God made. Uh, we know in Exodus uh, 25, 31, that in the tabernacle of Israel, that there were various things that were, uh, cre that were crafted and were in the tabernacle that were meant to hearken back to the garden, that were, were meant to remind us of that original temple uh, that, that God made for us to commune with him in. In Exodus 25, 31, Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. There, the candlestick that was in the tabernacle, it says, it speaks about how it has its branches and it has its, its knops or its, its buddings and it has the flowers in it. And elsewhere it talks about how the bowls of the, of the candlestick were to be made like to almonds, to, to hearken to an almond tree. And so here we see that this, is suppo this, this candlestick was supposed to represent a tree, and I think it was to represent the tree of life that God gave to man. And likewise, the guardian angels, which after the fall of man were stationed outside of the Garden of Eden, are de were depicted in the tabernacle and in the temple after it. In Exodus 26, 31, thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. With these cherubims, these angels depicted on the linen curtain. And in verse 33, thou shalt hang up the veil between the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of of the testimony. And so uh, this was to, this was to uh, block off from uh, and guard the way to the, the, ta to, the, um, to the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony that was made and placed in there. In Genesis 3.24, we read about the, uh, the cherubims and how they stand with a flaming sword to guard the garden of the Lord. And Eden, as we read earlier when, it, uh, when we were reading about Satan, is even called the holy mountain of God. In Ezekiel 28 and verse 13, it says that Satan had been in Eden, the garden of God. And in verse 14, it says, Thou wast upon the holy mount of God, the holy mountain of God of God. The, 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 uh, this is sacred space that God made. The, the garden that is set up on the mountain that is, that is there so that men may go up and worship God in it. And so God set up this garden of Eden, this place to worship God, this church, so that men could go up into the garden and worship God there. And man, of course, had his home there at the beginning. It wasn't just a tabernacle. It wasn't just a, an earthly temple, but it was the home of Adam and his wife Eve. 
Uh, we remember that man was chosen by God. Though, uh, though man is a lowly creature, he's made of the dust of the earth. Yet it says that God made man in his own image in Genesis chapter 1. And because God chose man out of all of the beasts of the field, out of, out of all of the creation that he had made, to, to bring him into this tabernacle. He, and so he made it the home of mankind. And this means also that man was to be God's holy priest. And we're getting into his occupation and his religion, which kind of blended together, we see here. The first job of mankind, the, the, the first occupation that he filled, was that he was the priest of God. And that was his primitive religion. The first religion of mankind was exercised in the garden. And man was serving there as God's priest. In Genesis 2 and verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. We've mentioned this several times, and you, you may be um, sick of hearing it. But nonetheless, as, when it says that he was put in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, these have to do with priestly service, specifically that he was sent to keep the garden, to guard the garden against any impurity that might arise and come into the garden. In Numbers 3 and verse 7, it speaks to the children of Levi, and it says, They shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. They are keeping their charge, and that's the same word there. They, they are guarding the tabernacle of the congregation to keep any impurities from coming into that tabernacle. And Adam was to keep his charge in the garden of the Lord, to keep the garden. And when it says that he was supposed to dress and keep the garden, this means he was supposed to make it beautiful and also make good use of it in worshiping God. God gave him all the trees of the Garden of Eden for his meat to, to, to eat out of. Uh, he, he, he gave him the garden to live in, and he was supposed to keep the garden nice as his service to his God. In Genesis 2.16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He was supposed to keep the garden. He was supposed to dress it and make good use of all that God had made in the garden. And he was to keep this one prohibition. Do not eat of this one tree. And man was also from the garden to multiply in the earth and teach his children likewise to worship God. Religion is not just a personal religion. Even from the very beginning, Adam's religion was not just to himself, but he had his wife and if, and if he had not fallen before he had children, he would have had children to teach that faith unto. In Genesis 1 verse 28, God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. He was supposed to multiply, he was supposed to have children, and he was supposed to teach them the same way that he was taught of God. God's purpose in child rearing, the, the, the consistent testimony of the scripture, is to pass the faith down to them. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. He was supposed to, to uh, just as later it says in the law, he was supposed to pass this down to his children, to teach them to do all the things that he himself did in worshiping God. And all of this, man's occupation and man's religion, is summed up in a great doctrine of the Scripture. And that is the doctrine of the covenant of works. 
We've talked about covenant already. We talked about the covenant of redemption, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost made a pact together. They made an agreement or a plan about how they would create the world and glorify themselves in it. Well, the covenant of works is likewise a covenant that is not made within the Trinity, but rather is made by the Trinity towards mankind. It's a covenant that's imposed on mankind by God who made us. The covenant of works is the law which God imposed on man before the fall. In it, God had made the promises that if man kept this law, he would live forever in his sight. And if man disobeyed this law, he would be condemned to die and put out of the garden. The covenant of works is this agreement. Adam, dress and keep the garden. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth as I've made you to do. And do not eat of this one tree. I've given you all other trees, the Lord says, to be your food, except for this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat of that tree and the day you eat of it, you will die. And otherwise, it was given to him to live forever. Now, the covenant of works is a sovereign covenant of God. God imposes it on all mankind at the beginning of the world. God made man, and so he has a right to impose such a covenant on him. He has the right to tell man, this is how it's going to be. And man can say nothing against it. In Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Because God created everything, He is worthy to receive all honor, all glory, all obedience. Uh, He has the, the right to impose covenant as He sees fit. And again, the duties of this covenant were that man fill his role as a priest, and that he not transgress in that thing God prohibited him to do. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not even eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, he was to dress and keep and to not eat of the tree. And in this covenant also, which was imposed by God onto man, Adam was made, as it's called, the federal representative of all mankind. That is, Adam represents us in the way that his obedience is accounted as our obedience, or his disobedience is counted as our disobedience. That is, as all mankind's obedience or disobedience. And so man was was given this covenant by God, God imposed this on Adam, And he in it, as our covenant head, as our federal representative, represents us morally before God. If he sins, we sin. If he obeys, we obey along with him. In Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. By one man's disobedience, by one man's sin, many others were made sinners. And that's the nature of Adam's representing us, is that his righteousness or his unrighteousness becomes our unrighteousness or our righteousness. And so we may ask the question with this, isn't it unjust Is it unjust for God to make such a covenant with man? And we'll we'll be close to closing with this. Is it unjust for God to count the disobedience of one man as the disobedience of all mankind? Is that unrighteous? The scripture says that it is righteous. That it is just. That the holy God, the pure God, did this. And so it is 
good. God, as we said, has the right to do this. Uh, He is the creator of heaven and earth, of the sea and the dry land. He is the God who made the angels above. He's the God who made the bacteria beneath. God is the God who made all reality apart from himself. And he has the right to do this. He is the God who made you and I. And if he chooses to count us unjust because of the sin of one man, he has every right to do it. And we can say nothing against him. We also see that he is not unjust because we have all also personally sinned. It's not just that Adam sinned. It's not just because he disobeyed, but because we disobeyed also. Because we sinned along with him. And when we sin, we show our solidarity with him. We show that were we in that circumstance, were we in his place, we would have sinned also. We would have taken of that fruit also. And finally we see that it must be true and it must be just Because Christ represents us in the exact same way. Adam is not the only federal representative in the world. Christ is also. And in the exact same way. Read again in in Romans 5 verse 19 where it says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners... So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That obedient one is Christ Jesus. In the same way that by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so too by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And so, because if we believe that it's just, If we believe that it's good that God account us righteous with Christ's righteousness, we must also affirm that it is just for him to account men unrighteous and wicked and sinful because of the disobedience of Adam in the garden. And we'll talk more about this at a later time, but I thought I'd bring that up tonight. And so, believers, the original purpose of God for the creation, has not changed. We saw just how God made man to be in the garden, to be his priest, to worship in his holy temple, and his purposes have not changed. Just because man fell into sin does not mean God is not intent on bringing us into his presence. In 1 Peter 2 verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are a a holy priesthood, it says, by Christ Jesus to come into his temple, to, to meet with his people, and to offer up spiritual sacrifice to him, to, to, to serve the role as priests under Jesus Christ. God's purposes have not changed for us. He still wants us to be priests to him, to worship him, to have our religion, not just to ourselves, but amongst ourselves in the tabernacle of God. And this again, he is accomplishing by the salvation in Jesus Christ through his redemption of us. In Revelation 1 verse 5, it speaks of Jesus Christ, who is the faithful and true witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Because of what Christ did, because that Christ died on the cross, and washed us from our sins in His own blood, He has restored us to the tabernacle of the Lord. He has restored us to being priests to our God. 
And so we ought as believers here to fill that role. Christ died so that we would be made kings and priests. And we ought to act like it. We ought, we ought to take on us the roles that He has given to us. And I don't mean this as, as being self-willed. We ought not to, to go out and proclaim ourselves to be kings on the earth. But rather, when we gather here together, we ought to see each other. We ought to see that one another, by Christ Jesus, are kings. And we priests to do service to God towards them. We ought to minister His graces one to another as kings and priests. And so we ought to bring all of our lives to focus around this, that Christ has redeemed us for this purpose, to do His commandments, to love one another as He has loved us. In Hebrews 10 verse 21 it says, And having an high priest, that is Jesus Christ, and high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We ought to gather and we ought to consider one another to provoke to love, to provoke to good works, to minister Christ's graces to one another. Because when we gather together in the church here, in a spiritual sense, we are coming back to Eden. We are going back to our home, to where, to where God first made mankind and first promised to give Him good things, to give Him a family. And though Adam sinned, and brought mankind into condemnation, we have been brought back into Eden by a better way than His. Because Christ Jesus is our obedience. Because we will not be kicked out of this. Because Christ is righteous. And Christ died on the cross for us. And Christ is risen for us. And He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And so when we gather in the church, we ought to see that we're gathering back together in Eden. And no one will ever suffer us to leave again. And so we ought to gather with hope and joy in our hearts, believers. And now if there's an unbeliever here tonight, read the passage that we read before again in Romans 5 verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience... Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Because of Adam's sin, you are a sinner. Just as our father was, so are you. The apple has not fallen far from the tree. We not only have the imputed sin of Adam, you not only have the imputed sin of Adam, but also personal sin with it as well. You know the law, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet, honor thy father and thy mother. And you by your personal sin are guilty of these sins. And therefore, you are condemned under the law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But just as Adam's sins were imputed to his children, so by faith in Christ can his righteousness be imputed to you. Can his death for sin be imputed to you? His being punished for sinners, though he knew no sin himself, can be accounted for you. Though you have sinned, Christ is dead on the cross. Christ has, has died on the cross and has risen again for the justification of His people. And by faith in His name, you can be saved. Just as it said before, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. By the obedience of Christ, 
that he lived a sinless life, that he did no guile, that he did no violence to any man, that he healed the sick, that he had a positive righteousness before God, and because of his passive obedience, that he went and died on the cross for sinners to do away with the condemnation of sin. By faith in his name, you can be counted righteous. And so I pray that you would come to Christ and be saved. Romans 3.22 speaks even of the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Are you of mankind tonight? Are you a son or daughter of Adam? Then there is no difference. If you will come by faith in Christ Jesus, His righteousness will be given to you as a free gift. And you can come and enter back into Eden with us again. And at Christ's coming, you will see a physical Eden, a renewed creation that we can all enter back into together. And again, believers, I pray that we would take these things, that we would ponder them in our hearts, that we would remember that Christ Jesus has brought us into a good place, a better place even than Adam enjoyed. And he has more to give us in the days ahead. And so let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for the scriptures. Lord, we thank you for the record of man's first home, the Lord of your garden that you planted for him. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see that he was in it by his own merit. Lord, he was in it in an unstable way. Lord, in a way that he ultimately fell from. But Lord, we thank you that in Christ Jesus, that by simple faith in his name, we have a sure assurance. Lord, that we know that we are back in that state before you. Lord, that we have a right to walk right up to the tree of life and partake. Lord, because Christ has died for us. And Lord, if he died for us, will you withhold anything from us? Lord, we pray tonight that you would help us to consider one another. Lord, to exhort one another to love and good works. Lord, we pray that you would help us to minister to those who couldn't make it to worship tonight. Lord, we pray that in their sickness you would help us to encourage them. Lord, to be mindful of them in our prayers. And Lord, we just pray that you would bring them back in your due time to worship with us again. Lord, we pray that you would give us someone we can speak to about Christ this week. Lord, we ask you would open their hearts to receive him. And Lord, we just ask that all we say and do would be right according to what he's told us of himself. Lord, we love you and thank you for all that's in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.